Welcome, everybody. The title of the session is Don't Fail Fast, Learn Fast. Failing fast is an option, but innovating as fast is a must. And in this, we'll be trying to be as interactive as we can, and we'll be uh, trying some experiments. So we hope you'll uh, enjoy the ride here. Uh, Yuta. Yes, also welcome from my side. Um, so probably you are here because you have seen what are the goals of this workshop. And when we were preparing for the workshop, we found also out, well, these this is actually a lot of stuff what we put in here as goals. And if you really closely look to the different goals, you will find out that actually, indeed, it all sums up to understand how to learn and innovate fast. So this is what we want to discuss with you today, what we want to address today. And here is our little agenda. Right. And the agenda, uh, besides doing the welcoming that we're doing right now, is we'll be setting a context. What does it mean to learn fast and fail fast? And we'll be looking at frameworks for thinking. And we'll be touching on something called transformative learning, which is different than ordinary learning. Uh, that's cumulative learning. Uh, we'll be uh, looking at something called probes. What are probes? And breaking them down into um, designing an experiment and measuring things so that you uh, can see the whole cycle of, of uh, how, how you try to learn fast. Um, and so, Yuta, over to you. Yeah, so we would like to know from you, what do you regard as the biggest challenges for companies today? In order to do so, please go to menti.com and use the code 1701384. And if you go there, then what you do is um, you just enter, for example, a word, or also you can put like two words there, or if it must be a sentence, but it would be better like keywords here. And... Um, you, I believe you can put in up to three different words. And we are waiting here for you to hear what do you regard as, as the biggest challenges for companies today. I just saw that uh, Sandeep has provided the uh, link. And here is the code again. Yes, now I see. Great. People, people have found up. it. Yep. Yes. Okay, we have disruption here. Change management is a challenge for companies. COVID, for sure, is a challenge for everyone, for the whole world, no matter if you're a company or an individual, I assume. Um, what else? Again, go to menti.com. There are more people have got there. Yeah, Sandeep was, had shared the link above. Limit work in progress is one thing yeah, that people start to work on a lot of stuff at the same time. So parallel work is something that's happening all too often. Then we have sharing purpose across, which is kind of avoiding silo work. That's at least how I interpret it. Then, oh, the new norm. I recently heard people saying, oh, I can't hear that term anymore. <laughs> yes, adjusting to the new norm. That's that's quite true. Then connect or connection. Yeah, probably despite the thing that we can't see each other right now. Creativity, I like that very much. Fits nice. Accountability, communication, always a a topic. I remember uh, the late Chair Weinberg, who once said, whenever. You see a problem and people will say it's a technical problem. Be sure it's always a people's communication problem. And I guess that's true. We see more coming up. Empathy, innovation, monotony and slow. Okay. Yeah. Culture, burnout, deliver value. Um, what else? Skills for future. Yes. Is there anything that jumps to your eyes, John, that I haven't? One, one thing that jumps is that nobody is repeating the same word. It you seems can, so, yeah. You, there's you can like repeat one, the same word if you want. Yeah. Uh, vote, vote for that. Yeah, that's true. 
yeah, it looks like everyone comes up with something different, which is also interesting. Maybe that's a, also a signal of the, the time. That, mm-hmm. ah. Okay. We, we also have a varied audience, I think. Maybe. So that this is why, um, yeah, different things are coming up. It seems it's slowing down. And now, well, just because one word has been repeated, it's the learning part. I really like that. And, and well, of course, I guess we have to like that because the topic of the talk <laughs> workshop is don't fail fast, learn fast, right? So learning fast is really at the core. And if you are not interested in learning, I guess you wouldn't be here. So that um, makes perfect sense. So I think I move on. You can still keep uh, bringing them in. That's fine. We keep those and we'll also share the slides, of course, afterwards, including your challenges that you found. And I want to move on to the next thing, which is actually um, probably it's more the point, but we used to name it before the pandemic. We were all talking about we are living in this VUCA world. Now, a lot of the things you were coming up with are kind of a different way of ex- expressing this book of world, which is that, well, everything is just volatile, it's uncertain, complex, and also ambiguous. However, being really honest with you, although at least John and I, and I know also a lot of other colleagues of us, they are talking about the book of world for, it seems like, ages. And it always had been... I don't know, almost a bit artificial to explain what it really means. Of course, we could say, or or we said, well, there was like Airbnb disrupting the market or Uber disrupting the market and this and that. So, So different possibilities for different markets, but still people were like giving us that stare. And, um, so if you will, the pandemic now is the best example for the world because Companies have put so much effort into coming up with plans for 2020. And at latest in March, all the plans showed like they were a waste. They were all the effort that have been put has put in into those was just a waste of time and money, of course, as well. So just think about like budgets for this year. It's just not anything like what people have imagined that would happen. So, and this is really probably the best example. And now we don't have that many problems anymore explaining what VUCA really is and does to us. Well, the pandemic is really to the extreme. But on the other hand, we are facing stuff like that all the time. So the VUCA world is actually asking companies to be agile. And what we mean with agile here is really not that companies need to use Scrum all over the place. What we mean with that is that they have to be agile in the literal sense. And the literal sense means they have to be responsive, flexible, fast, timely, nimble, all of that. And so actually, companies are asked, well, I said like being agile, but actually it's thinking beyond agile. And one way of doing that, thinking of beyond agile, is looking at what John and I created, the Bossa Nova, which brings together different streams and allows people to expand their horizon by looking at, okay, is there a different way how we can do budgets? And can can we do those without like fixing them one year in advance? So that's the B for beyond budgeting. Or is there a way how we can leverage the full potential of every employee in order to have the full innovative power of everyone by using the principles of open space? Or how can we use the power in a way that it's really shared and decentralized so everyone can make the decision about the stuff he, she knows the most? And then, of course, there's Agile, which brings in mainly the inspect and adapt. So this is kind of a glimpse of what Bossa Nova offers. But the key thing is thinking beyond Agile, thinking about what other different streams, frameworks are offering and bringing those together in order to expand your horizon. 
now we want to look exactly into this, into like expanding your horizon. Great. So I'm going to use a, a little story to illustrate that. And because everybody reads at different speeds, I'm going to actually read the story out here and let you think with me about uh, what does this have to do about horizons. So here's the story. A clever little girl and her father were shopping in a little neighborhood store. As they packed up their purchases, the owner of the store offered the little girl some free sweets in a bowl. Get a handful of sweets, the merchant said to the girl. The girl just stood there looking up at her father. The owner repeated himself, honey, take, take a handful of sweets. They're free. Again, the girl did not move, continuing to look up in the face of her father. Finally, the father reached into the bowl and got a handful of sweets and put them in a bag. As they walked home, the father asked his daughter why she didn't take a handful of candy um, from the bowl. The girl, with a big grin on her face, looked at her father and said, dot, 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 what do you think the girl said? Okay, so in the discuss, let's, why don't you put in some thoughts about what did the girl say? Or what, excuse me, what, 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 did, what did the girl say about why she didn't grab a handful of candy? So use the chat for that. Yeah, so, ha. We have a few answers here. I, and I'm, okay. The, I'm seeing, if you go to audience public, you see them. So one is your handful is more than mine. That's hand is bigger. Very good. Very Indian good. Everybody got it. Hands. Yeah, many Probably people got it. Hand. Right. Many, many people got the answer. Um, and uh, many people don't get the answer. But what we have is, uh, even though you got the answer, is perhaps a framework shift. Um, when you're, when the, you, you may have been seeing the little girl as like, what's wrong with her? And then when it's you, you see that, oh, she, she had a purpose that you now understand, that's called a framework shift. You see it differently. And that's what we're looking for at the beginning of the cycle that is helping you learn fast. Uh, innovating fast is a must. So it's that framework shift that we're looking for. And we'll do another exercise a little bit later in the presentation to uh, let you see if you are still, um, or, or, or show you a framework shift in a different way. Right. So we also would like to bring this a little bit back to where you might be able to use stuff what we are sharing here right away. And for doing so, I would like to do a little re recap with you on retrospectives, which is one of my favorites anyway. So it's, <laughs> I always love to do that. So a retrospective, as you probably know, means that we are regularly reflecting and what, on what's helping us, what's hindering us and how we can get more effective and also more efficient in what we are doing. Or if you will, how can we deliver a better value to the customer and whatever better means in our context. It could be faster. It could be more innovative. It could be anything. And a retrospective, that's the, the recap, typically um, is, is defined by those five phases. You, If you haven't seen those before, I highly recommend to you go and get the book from Diana Larson and Esther Derby where they uh, describe agile retrospectives and where those phases are in. So you start with a welcome and set the stage. Then you gather data of if it's a, like a sprint retrospective of your last sprint. But you, you can also look at a different time frame. But let's stick, a, let us stick with the scrum process. So we gather data of the last sprint. Then we start generating insights. So what does the data tell us? So it's a kind of a reflection based on the data that we've collected. So people might have found that, well, the tests are always failing or whatever. And so we generate insights. Okay. What does that mean? And, and does this happen all the time or just uh, occasionally and so on? Then we decide what to do. So it's coming up with actions and um, for those actions, we often then also have like a commitment. Is this really what we wanted to do? Is this the difference we, we want to make with 
um, by implementing those actions. And then we close and, um, yeah, the, this part and we meet next two weeks later. Now, the thing what we think is, well, maybe I go to this later, <laughs> but I just thought, sorry, stay with me. So I first have a reflection for you. Think about three actions that have been decided in your last retrospective. If you if you are not doing retrospectives, then I'm pretty sure you know other kinds of workshop stuff where you come up with any kinds of actions and just think of those. So think about three actions decide decided in your last retrospective. And if you want, you are we would be happy if you would share one of them or so in the chat, but there's you don't have to. So we know it's sometimes it's company confidential. Really we give you a little bit of time to think of that. These are already wonderful examples that, that I see here. You, you all are able to see them as well, so I'm not reading them all out. Um, I don't know. Let's take the one that I'm seeing right in front of my face, which is from Rajiv, more time for refinement. So that's uh that's an issue actually i have seen more often that teams are coming up with this it's uh, which is also true for some of the others that i've seen here so they are often kind of similar things that we see in, in similar teams or so so the kind of the problem that at least we are seeing here that very often we gather data, generate insight, decide on actions like the ones we are having here, like more time for refinement. But what's actually missing is on the one hand, what's our hypothesis? What do we think we will achieve by go doing implementing this action? And maybe even more important, how can we measure that this action actually has made that difference or maybe it was the wrong action or maybe it was the wrong hypothesis and the problem sits actually somewhere else and we need a different hypothesis so the thing that's often missing not only in retrospectives but the retrospectives are a great example for we are way too often jumping into actions without reflecting on what could be our hypothesis and how can we measure if we made a difference? So the title of the presentation is Innovating Fast. But so why don't we just jump and do something? So this is a little bit of let's go slower to go fast. In that list that you just saw, you uh, – saw that there was a uh, gather insights and that was a, kind of the point that I was making with the, the little girl and asking her father to uh, quietly to uh, be the person gathering the sweets. Um, that insight shouldn't lead just right to action, not only when you're in, an, in a retrospective, but any time that you're thinking together, it doesn't have to be a retrospective. Being having the discipline to say, huh, that's interesting. What if is the beginning of developing a hypothesis? So you need to act, but you need to act in a very deliberate way. And that's the key to innovating fast 
is to have this discipline that we're uh, now getting into. The um, so let's. What is a hypothesis? We've we've uh, uh, said uh, using Rajiv's example, we need more time for refinement. Okay, um, then the hypothesis might be that if we take more time for refinement, then we will have a more effective sprint the next time. And now you need, oops, there we go. Um, So the first thing you say about, gee, what if we try more time for refinement is exactly what to expect to happen. Uh, Let's be precise and what conditions is it under. So um, we expect maybe that we complete the, the sprint completely or that we, you know, what is it we expect to happen? Because that then becomes the basis of how you're, you're measuring. And under what conditions? Is it um, that everybody is present in the sprint all week? Um, is it that um, we don't have a change in the way the server is operating or whatever the conditions are? And so you need to come up with those kinds of statements to be clear, like, what is it you really think is happening? Our hypothesis is that if we do this under these conditions, then such and such will happen. And uh, then you do, you have to design an experiment um, because you're trying out things fast, but you're trying them out small. Um, So the, what is it, uh, how is it that you're testing your assumption? And how is it that you're measuring? Well, the first thing is is that you need to measure before you start and <clears throat> be able to look back if it's needing time for refinement. How much refinement time did you have? How did you measure it? What constitutes refinement time? And then, of course, you have to measure afterwards. And then it really helps if you have some way to compare, like maybe you have a similar group that isn't doing this and you can compare so that you really have something to see, uh, some way to know what really happened. And whatever you come up with should be small, should be very specific, and it also should be something that you can do. So it's not some grand idea. Uh, so this is what we're trying to do in, in uh, the, the full cycle of things, reflecting on your situation Typically, it's what you might do in a retrospective, but it can be outside of that entirely. This doesn't have to happen with with a programming team or in the context of a sprint. And the um, th- that is uh, getting the insights is uh, when we we saw the steps that you take for uh, a, a, re- a retrospective is reflecting on your situation. What we're introducing next is to say design a probe. You've all heard of Snowden, um, uh, early talking earlier in the the uh, conference about probing to make sense of what's going on, and you're dealing with complexity uh, almost always when you're trying to think what do we do next. So you design a probe. A probe consists of a hypothesis and the design of your experiment all together. So you have to design that experiment, then try it out for the specified period of time. And after you've done the experiment, there are two things that happen. One is that the inner loop here that you see, it, you have to have that lead you to the next time you get together to think, huh, we tried that experiment. We tried more time for refinement. Then what happened? Maybe good things happened. Maybe it didn't happen. But whatever happened, happened. It may, may be that you didn't get what you expected. Something else happened. But you also need to publish it to your peers. Now, that can be just the the group in your office. It can be in the company newsletter. It could be in the the Agile Alliance's uh, publication system. It can be a paper that you do. Uh, It can be something through your network. But it's really critical to also publish what you're doing to the extent you can, given company confidentiality requirements. Publish what you're doing to your peers. And why? Why do you tell other people? It's so that they can try to replicate what you're doing. And when they do try, you learn from their attempts to replicate it. It's kind of like a, a, a asking, is, is this reliable, what we've come up with? Is it valid? 
Um, you know, how does it vary given other situations? Uh, and if you're publishing to your peers, then maybe they'll publish to you and you learn from them what they're doing. So this is the full cycle of uh, being innovative. And it takes some discipline that we're not necessarily used to. You talk, like, go ahead. Sorry. We would like to look at how is such a probe defined? Well, again, as, as John said, you heard it from Dave Snowden and also what, what John was kind of, he was giving you a peek into that. So the definition of a probe in this context, in order to learn fast, is that a probe is defined by small, safe-to-fail experiments, and they're based on hypotheses. Well, we have talked about hypotheses already, that are derived from reflection, on the current situation as well as on theory. So most of it, I guess, should now sound a little bit familiar. So for example, derived from reflection on the current situation, that's actually what gather data and generate insight does for you in the retrospective. If you're using this approach, what we highly recommend also outside a retrospective for coming up, for example, for, with new product ideas or so, then you still need to have that thing where you have time for reflection on what's the situation, for example, for the market, for a specific customer, or maybe for yourself. And also in theory, so what is out there and, and what do you know from maybe science about that topic you are reflecting on. And then you use that reflection in order to come up with your hypothesis. So kind of a, a what if thing and uh, John was elaborating on that. And then again, based on the hypothesis, you come up with the experiments. Now, I think we haven't really talked about safe to fail experiments. And um, there are different things that we mean with that. So one thing is safe to fail is in a way that, well, actually in our, in our opinion, an experiment embedded in a probe never really fails because if it's not working out the way you thought it will, the only thing it is, it's success because it might invalidate your hypothesis or it will tell you it's the wrong experiment and that's a success. It's not a failure because you gained more knowledge and that's especially coming back to like these times, the VUCA times or the pandemic times, this is super important. So this is one way of looking at into safe to fail. The other thing of looking into safe to fail means also about who is affected by the experiment or well maybe even exaggerating a little bit or I hope it's a little bit exaggerated that the people you are doing the experiments with and again remember that's exaggerating how I just phrased that because if you think of it this way, then you kind of look at the people as maybe guinea pigs. And this is not what we mean here by no way. But what we mean actually, again, having it as safe to fail, that it's safe for everyone to say, well, I would really like to try that. And no matter if the experiment then validates the hypothesis or invalidates it, the person is fine. And also, if somebody says, well, I'm not really in for that, I don't want to try that, then there's also no punishment. So no punishment for either taking part in an experiment or not. And that's sometimes, I think, ignored, because sometimes, especially in, in the HR world, I, I sometimes feel that, that scrum masters, HR coaches come up with ideas and kind of put them on the team. And not really leaving the, the, yeah, the leeway for them to decide what do they think is safe to fail. So keep that in mind. So this is another maybe angle to a safe to fail experiment. We would right. like. I, yeah. I was just going to give an example of a safe yes. to fail experiment. Let's say that you decide you're going to change the way you're doing performance evaluations of everybody 
and it affects how much money they might make. Uh, and if they engage in the experiment, what happens if the experiment doesn't work? Do you punish them or they get less money in, in, for, under the old system? So you, you want to be really sure that people are not going to get hurt by uh, what it is you're doing. That would be an example of a safe-to-fail experiment. Very good. Thank you. So we would now like you to do another little reflection, which could be also related to a retrospective, because that's, I assume, a lot of people are doing here from the audience. But again, it could be also a different context than a retrospective. So come up with a challenge, and it can be key or not, that you tried, you can be you or and your team, probably it's more that your team try to solve more than once. So think about something, well, the way it sometimes appears is that it It is a topic that pops up in almost every retrospective and maybe maybe never it's addressed or maybe it is addressed, but it doesn't go away. So next time it pops up again. And um, yeah, I would like you to, to give a, a minute or so to reflect on it. And again, um, if you want to share Anything about that in the chat while you're reflecting, you're, the chat is open. And while you still maybe think about this and reflect on it, my question, oh, I see some, oh, there's Dolly. Hi, Dolly. <laughs> Challenge, have a healthy backlog, for example, stories in ready state and can be accommodated for men two, two, three sprints is a challenge that came up in here. Yeah, that's cool to see you. Oh, well, we don't see you. Um, so the question that we are having right now is, what was it like thinking about that? Thinking about a challenge a challenge that you try to solve more than once. And we would like you to raise your hand if you want to share what was it like thinking about that and maybe also elaborating on that um, challenge you came up with. So if you raise your hand in the Q&A section, then this would help us. And, and at the moment, I'm I not don't sure. do, do, do we do people know how to raise their hands? Maybe Sandeep, you have to check. Ah, Sandeep says there's a button on the right to raise the hand. And now I wonder. Hey, everyone. Uh Once you raise your hand, I meet you on the stage, and you will have to accept the invite to be uh, able to speak. So please don't forget to accept the invite once I uh, put you on the stage. Yeah, we try that, but at least I don't find the raise your hand thing. But I hope people do. I I don't see it either, uh, Sandeep. Oh, there was Dolly. I think Dolly raised her hand. I guess. Let me see. Is that true? No. This. Sandeep, is it on the very right side of the screen? Ah. I um. Hey, Uta and John. Yeah. Ah. 
Okay, Great. wonderful. So Sandeep helped us. Very good. So Dolly, can you share with us like what was that challenge you tried to solve more than once? And more important, like how was it to think about that right now? So what was your way of thinking? Okay, uh, the challenge that I uh, wanted to share is uh, it is happening uh, time and again that when we are doing the skin planning, we do not have enough stories groomed and brought to a ready state, which can be quickly picked up and put in the planning. Uh, we end up spending a lot of time in this planning session, more than is that is required. And uh, the suggestion is to have the refinements in a way that we do all the grooming and bring those stories to ready state so that we can save time during planning not to discuss everything from the scratch. This is the issue that we are trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And it is not just for one sprint. We have to use refinements in a way that uh, we will have enough backlog items for the upcoming sprints as well. So it's also kind of interesting because we accidentally picked Red Chief's topic before, which was more time for refinement. So this fits in nicely. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. So and how was it for you now thinking about a challenge that's coming up again and again. <laughs> it is really frustrating. Uh, yeah. It is frustrating because we are identifying that as a challenge, but there is no proper action or uh, not enough action is taken. Right. Yeah. Probably you come up with actions or, or don't you? Did, you? did you come up with actions before? Yes, we have set up more refinement <laughs> sessions, but uh, there were challenges again in the sense uh, team members thought that there were too many meetings, which was kind of blocking them from working on the sprint goal. Okay, so one thing that I'm hearing so is on the one hand, it's, well, it was frustrating and it's not the one hand, that's the key thing. And probably the frustration came by well, you talk about this over and over and come up with one action after the other, and probably you also implement the action, but still that topic comes up, right? Okay, I I think this is this is good for now. Is it, John? You have any more questions? Yeah, yeah, I think so. No, the the refinements the uh, thing is a good thing to explore more um to to see how we can start coming up with uh something that is uh like gets a, a mental framework transformation so i hand it over to you okay thank you thank you dolly um so you remember that we saw in the example of the little girl uh that we in order to understand what she was doing we had to think differently about what she was doing here she was being asked to do something very logical but it seemed like she was just being shy or something and so our initial thought was okay the little girl is being shy poor little girl but then uh when we say oh actually she's being very clever um then we could think about it the whole situation in a different way so with the refinement question i see i hear that um people are saying too many meetings uh, and we uh, then say, well, what's a different way of thinking about too many meetings? Oh, I'm frustrated. It's a waste of time. What's really going on here? Um, is there is there a way that we can frame the problem or reframe it together so that we can get different insights? And one of the things this chart doesn't say is it doesn't ask us to think about how we're thinking. That's something called a reflexive inquiry. How are, we're thinking about this. Oh, this it's it's too many uh, meetings that we're having. Well, the, really, why? What is the? It sounds like the framework we're thinking of is that we ought to maximize our time. Really, what happens if we don't try to maximize our time? Maybe we try to have even more meetings. Who knows? 
But that that kind of possible hypothesis comes out of saying, why are we thinking that way? What is it that we're thinking? As you think this way, there are some things that you'll notice. The the you, you were sort of thinking about this today individually, but as the team thinks together the, with questions like that, what happens if we have even more and more meetings? Um, you become boundaryless in that it doesn't seem like it's your observation anymore, but the team, if it's really working effectively, will just feel like, hey, we're all thinking in this together. And you'll um, be coming up with, wow, what happens? Maybe two or three of you could meet even more often. And does that lead to um, uh, better refinement? Um, And so you come up with things that you can try against very small experiments to see what it is you're dealing with. Maybe maybe we do want to have even more meetings. And then... um, the you, you you look for views that may be discomforting or challenging. Somebody says we shouldn't be meeting at all. What happens if we don't meet at all? Let's let the thing self-organize. Or maybe the num- amount of time meeting is not what is the problem. Maybe we need to be th- doing something different when we meet. And that kind of uh, looking for uh, things that just dis- you know say this is. Totally, this is ridiculous what you're thinking right now. What if we think of this other wild thing? Is the way that you build to the point where you may have a sudden leap of, of uh, uh, insight. And uh, so that process of thinking about how we're thinking is something that you need to do very deliberately in your thought process. That that thing about in the steps in, in a um, retrospective about getting insights that's not just oh yeah let's you know let's think better about this together and maybe throw some stickies on the wall. It's very a very deliberate discipline, and what you're looking for is not um, like okay we learned this last week or that this last last time. It's some new framework, some new mindset for how it is you're thinking about your problem. Um, and uh, before we go into our experiment, Yuta, do you have anything to add? No, I think that's that's it. Okay. So we move into the experiment. Yes, let's go into the experiment. Yes. Uh, is everyone everybody. ready? Get set. Get set. Uh, ready, steady, go. Okay. Here are three statements. You see them there. And the question is, how can these three statements be true? And if you have seen that before, then probably you should be quiet. But if you uh, haven't. Right. Um, Right. So take a moment to look at this. How can it be true? Um, I think Renchard has already a suggestion here. Yeah, he says six plus one plus one is ten. Six plus one is zero. Somebody else says six plus one plus three equals Ah, ten. Typo. Uh, Sorry, typo. Okay. Uh, Yeah. All right, but all three of these statements have to be true. Yeah, but I think I can't follow Ranchard's uh, thinking, which is six plus one is seven plus three is ten, and one plus zero is one. I think this is what he's okay. saying. Well, then, um, then how can number? How can the second statement be true then? Oh, see, he's getting somewhere. Seven plus five is, is maybe it's working out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. What about, and what the, about the last? Oh, but now the last one. He's saying 10 is then one plus zero. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ah, sorry, Renchard, sorry. Yeah. So what are some more do you have, do you have uh, then also a solution for the third one? With the zero. Are there any more? Um, ah, and other uh, Right. So, so Ranchard's idea holds true, true 
holds true for the first two statements, but I guess not for the not last. for the third one. Yeah. Anybody else have any ideas? Go ahead and make your comments. This is something that children generally get faster than adults. That's a hint. Another hint is, if you think of the little girl, maybe you have to shift the way you have been thinking. Yeah, how can you shift? And that's me you... saying I didn't solve it. So <laughs> <laughs> being very honest here. <laughs> I don't see any more solutions coming here. We we need to we need solve to, it. Yeah. Maybe. Go ahead. Shall we try to tell them the answer? Do they want to know the answer, do you think? Hmm. If somebody if somebody would like to see the answer, please enter it in the chat. Oh, here we have something. Oh, now it's oh. getting ooh, has, M plus one is eight times five. No. Is forty and okay. Okay, we're getting I mean, actually good. high as well. So that's true for the third one, but probably not for the other two. So they should be all follow the same rule in order same, to be true. same consistent logic. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, John. Okay. Yourself. All right. So let's think of a kindergartner here looking at this and the kindergartner uh maybe you could i don't know if they can see my arrow you two, you might want to put your arrow over the six i think i'm not sure i'm i don't want to touch it to be really okay. honest All i'm right. so glad that it's working okay. right now so, so look at the six in the first line and that six has a closed loop a little circle so there's one ah, closed I can do it. oh yeah and that the eight, the eight has two closed circles. That makes two. And the one, the one, seven, and five, there's no closed circle, so that's a zero. But the zero has a circle. The zero um, has a circle. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> that that's a contradiction. So yeah. so this the everybody. I think approach this as we have to put an operator in between the six and the one and the three or the one and the seven and the five. I need as well. And, and that's, that's the framework that you are bringing to this. So the question to be asking when you're reflecting is, well, why are we thinking that way? And it often helps to think about what would my kindergartner think here? Who doesn't, you know, how would they solve that problem? And that insight, that realizing how you're thinking about things is the key to thinking innovatively fast. And it's not necessarily how long you're taking to meet. It's really digging down and saying, what are we thinking about this? We, 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 don't, we don't have time for refinements, but what are we, is, is time really the, the essence of it or is it how we're thinking when we do get together? And how is it that we're thinking when we get together? This is the sort of thing that you have to ask when you're trying to ha get transformative learning. You transform by getting a new framework. And that's where your innovation comes from. So, In, yeah, go ahead, you two. Oh, okay. There are some other ideas for solving it. <laughs> Okay. Ordering and descending number and descending order, ascending order is zero. I'm not understanding that. I'm neither. However, the point was leave or try to understand what's the framework you are thinking from. And when once you are aware of that, you can also come up with a different framework of thinking. Yeah. And this is what we would like you to ask to do now. So we had earlier asked you to think of a challenge, key or not, that you have tried to solve more than once. And so the example was coming up with, with the same thing 
every once in a while in your retrospective or repeatedly in your retrospective. And it seems whatever you do, that thing doesn't go away, like what Dolly shared. So, and oh, people are still still trying to find different ways of solving that. Ah, okay. And what we would like you to do now is think of that challenge that's coming up more often and ask yourself, how are you thinking about the situation and the you, or here's the how am I thinking about the situation? You can really also expand that to how are we as a team actually thinking about the situation? What are we assuming? What would it be like if we wouldn't make that assumption? And what do you observe then? Can you validate that observation? And how would you do that? Um, so, so kind of what is your hypothesis here really? And again, the thing is trying to first getting aware of the framework you are thinking from and then coming up with hopefully a different way how to think about it. So getting away from, for example, the operators. And we would like first to give you a little bit of time to, to reflect on that. And if you're if you're willing, it would be great if you could then also raise your hand and we bring you up on stage to share how you're thinking about that. And um, I believe, Sandeep, we would need your help for that again. I'm not sure if I understood how to bring somebody on stage. Uh, the, the raise hand option should be on the right side where you're seeing the discuss buttons. Uh, Utah, John, and uh, me can't see it. Uh, but the audience should be able to see that. And once you raise it, raise your hand, I will go and invite you on the stage and you have to accept. So please don't forget to accept it to be on stage. And Sandeep, we can rely on you to invite people then on stage and yes. you pick whoever. It's yep. you are the one. Sure. Cool. Thank you. And if you don't want to come on stage, but maybe share some of your thoughts in the chat, that would be fine too. So kind of maybe you have an idea why you're stuck on that thing. Why is it you keep thinking in the same way about that challenge that's coming up again and again? So thinking of how, how John already kind of pointed this out when he talked about the transformative learning thing, if I take again the refinement thing, very often we first start thinking, well, actually, it's, that's a, a good thing also that's happening right now. 
Yeah, there's something we do not have enough backlog refinement sessions. Exactly. It's kind of the, the way I'm, I believe what we see a lot. So we plan on something and then it's not working out. And what our first reaction of this, we have to get better at planning. It's kind of like what, what Dolly is sharing here in the comment that, um, yeah, we, we don't have enough of those refinement sessions. And again, maybe that is true. And so you can try and have more of those refinement sessions. But if it doesn't lead you any more anywhere, so maybe that assumption is wrong and it's not the refinement sessions in the same way as it's not getting better at planning, but maybe you need to do almost the opposite to let go or, well, here we have another one from Tony. Maybe refinement meetings are not effective, not productive enough or giving expected outcome. Okay, so that would be a different way of thinking about not enough. So maybe the way the meeting is run is the problem. Or um, here, what Ranchard is sharing, how many action items are ideal after retrospective? And maybe this is just an open question. And um, actually, I can only, if I answer that, trying to answer it right away, fewer is always better. So my often, my recommendation is a maximum of three because we all have more things to do. And sometimes we feel like the more we think of doing the better it is however then maybe we don't have time to do it really in that way that we can observe if we really make a difference here sean do you want to add something here um i think that everybody is getting the point here the uh, about what did, how does this reflection process work how does it form the basis of uh, making a hypothesis um, and um, the, the I, th I think it's the key to handling VUCA is to mm -hmm. like really think about how are we thinking. Uh, we heard about Snowden this week. There's also a, a, a complexity theorist named Stacy who who encourages that way of thinking. Um, uh, you know, the, sort of the a different way of thinking about what Snowden's saying. But that, if you remember that you're in complex situations and you don't know the cause and effect, then that may help you really start to do the basic thinking that you need to come up with to do in a hypothesis. And having said that, I think we maybe look at what's a hypothesis look like. Okay. Or what are the details of a probe? And then a right. hypothesis is part more, of more about a probe, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Um, We've gotten to uh, designing a probe, and um, the um, you to I think actually uh, you, you can handle this. If you want, or I can go ahead. All right. Okay. So, uh, de designing a probe, um, the discipline here is not just coming up with action items, but actually um, doing the 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 discipline of designing the action item. Um, or the 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 experiment that you're going to conduct. So you have to name it. Um, the uh, better refinement might might be something. Uh, how can we have better refinement? It's it's helpful to um, put it in a in a question, <clears throat> and you need to put down the context, the background of the situation where we're dealing with refinements. Well, we have. Uh, uh, sprints around such and such topic. We're at such and such phase. Um, we have these people here with so and so only present some of the time. Whatever. That's it's really good to, to describe what you're dealing with. And then you need to say, we expect that if we have more five more refinement sessions rather than the three we've been having, we're going to have five of them. Um, and this is what we expect to happen, that we'll have the refinement sessions. We'll spend another hour in refinement thinking than we did before. And the impact will be that 
that we end up with fewer errors uh, when we present the the, um, the the product of the sprint. And we'll def define an error as whatever we define it. And um, that so it will be more effective in the following way. It's something that we can observe. And the observation doesn't have to be necessarily objective. It can be everybody feels better, but feeling better is defined as you rank it five on, on a scale of one to five or um, however you're reporting that. It can be uh, an observation of subjective feelings. And then um, the next thing to do is, is to having defined your hypothesis is to define exactly how we're going to do an experiment and see if our hypothesis um, uh, comes out. And the experiment depends completely on the situation, but um, it can be that uh, we're going to split the team in two and have half the team have these extra refinement times and half not, or maybe we invite the team next to us to try this out, but to just try doing the measurements, but not doing anything different. They then would become our control group. Um, and uh, we're not going to do this the whole time in the sprint. We're only going to do it halfway through, and then we're going to check and see what's happening or whatever. But um, the, the de defining that as precisely as you can and putting it in writing, you'd be amazed at what happens when you force yourself or you have the discipline to really put this in writing so that, at, you know, when you have your next sprint, you can look back and say, oh, yeah, that's what we thought at that point in time. So this is a discipline. It's a discipline that uh, intervenes before having an insight and actually saying, okay, you have an action item to do such and such. And uh, it's the, the, the path to trying to um, explain things better uh, as to yourself as to what's happening. Um, Yuta, you may have things to add to this, and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, well, actually, the, the what you were just saying reminded me of something else, which is, um, well, we showed this. No, I'm, I am experimenting here. I think you see, yeah, you see this circle again. A key thing is, and now we just keep being at the retrospective for, for just a moment. The important thing is also that you go here and look back in your next retrospective. Oh, what was the action we have decided upon? What was our hypothesis? How did the experiment come out? What do we measure? Because that's all too often also a thing where we are, we are coming up with an action and then there's an extra retrospective where we just start again from gather data, generate insights, and defining actions. So we also have to look back and see, did we actually make a difference here? And again, I use the retrospective here, or we, we both, we are using the retrospective at the moment as an example, but this is also true, like if you are looking at coming up with a new product, coming up with a new design, and you are going through like any kind of, of uh, design workshop here, and then you also here need to regularly come back and look at is the hypothesis actually has this been validated or not? Did the experiment really provide us the data we were hoping to get? Or maybe we need to come up with a different experiment. So a probe is super useful, but, but only if it's embedded in this circle and you keep coming back to, well, what was it actually we were thinking and what does it mean for us now? So this is kind of what I what I felt when I heard you that we probably need to stress once more. Um, maybe this is the time for sharing a sample probe here. And the sample probe is from Ashish Agarwal. Maybe some of you know him. And so this is actually the, an, an appropriation of the probe. So it's, um, I don't know, maybe two pages long if you look into all the details. And um, so the, the name of it is what John said in the slide before, 
It's a question hinting towards the hypothesis. How can we enable teams to discuss openly their impediments and improvements in retrospectives? And then the background is Agile is being followed in most teams and organizations. Now, they are also doing retrospectives, but most of the time, the right set of impediments and improvements are not the output of these retrospectives meetings, as they have a fear that if they speak up, it would impact them in appraisal. So this is kind of an observation of the current situation or the outcome of a reflection, really. And then the hypothesis here is, if we do not have managers in the retrospectives, then the team will open up, open up with their impediments and improvements as they will feel safe. And um, actually, well, he's more putting another reflection on like what I would normally say that the last paragraph should be, okay, what is actually the experiment? On the other hand, the hypothesis provides already a hint towards, which is like, not inviting managers, at least for some of the retrospectives, and then see what's happening. Now, one thing you might wonder is, how is exactly this probe related to innovation? At least I wondered about that after we have decided on this. And then I thought, well, isn't this exactly the case that we see way too often that innovation doesn't happen because people don't feel safe to speak up? So again, it doesn't have to be something in a retrospective. It's also if you think about being innovative around a product and even this can also happening in a, in a retrospective. So, um, hearing various voices, feeling safe. So psychological safety are really big topics for being innovative. And maybe you want to come up with a probe that helps you create that environment where that is possible. Now, one thing that I definitely want to share here, and um, to be honest, I'm not, I don't feel safe enough with the platform we are using here. And therefore, I'm just providing you um, two, well, I think. I'm providing you two links. So here's one link you can look at and maybe um, after the presentation and if you have questions about that, um, we can also share that. So there are two links that uh, where you can find different probes that have been developed by various people who are also, well, have, have used uh, their time for writing it up in order to publish it. Remember the publish to your peers section in that circle. So this also did happen. And so this is all on our website where you can access it, take a look at it. And maybe you find the one or other probe that can help you in your situation. Or maybe you find the one or other probe that can inspire you to come up with your own probe. And this is actually the thing that to be very honest, we see more often that people look at the probes, look at what other people have tried, and then coming up with what fits in their own context in terms of a probe, what's the hypothesis in my own context, and therefore also what is the experiment that I want to try and for how long. You, you Sean? Just, yeah, yeah, I was going to say before we, we go on, the, the remember that this is just an abstract. If you go to one of these two links, you'll see the whole thing written up, which is part of the discipline that we're recommending. It's interesting that after they tried this, they did, in fact, get more sharing of, of impediments, and they had a way of, of counting the number of impediments and the, the, uh, the, the in-depthness of them. They then experimented with bringing the manager back into the, into the session, and that's a whole other story, but that's the kind of path that they took to to make their their thinking together more effective that that came out of uh, experimenting uh, you know trying out new things. Uh, Excellent. I, I think yeah. that's all that I have to say. I really encourage everybody to go and look where people have been publishing uh, on our website some of these these um, the probes that they've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, now that you are stressing this again, I have to probably expand on that, what you see on the Narathon, this is where it's really have been also um, expanded. 
then um, under probes you you find a few others and then I'm not sure I don't find the right link for the other thing there's also resources where you find the probes that we have published in our book however for those you only have the abbreviations and I will share the link later but it's also under com. so you probably if you you find your way around that i'm i'm pretty sure but i don't have it ready right now here okay so i think we have um definitely one big topic left although we yeah. touched it and another one that's also not small but um so in terms of importance and we want to cover that so john right so we've talked some about about measurements um and um, the the uh, we talked some about the pre and post measurements. It it the the it's the, one of the biggest challenges of this process of being conscious about your hypotheses and and um, uh, carrying out an experiment is how do we measure it? Um, the the then there's some if the it's important that you use. Uh, controls because some of you may have heard of like the Hawthorne experiment where just the process of measuring things changes behavior. And so you really need to have somebody who's not doing those, um, the, the changes to really see um, whether what you're doing is actually making a difference. So if you have another group that's just doing the measurements and not doing the changes that you're talking about, then you have some way of saying, well, huh, they just did measuring and their results improved. Well, that may be just the Hawthorne effect that, that people, when they get measured, get like all happy and starting to do things better than they might have before. So the controls are, are really uh, important if you can find a way to do that at all. If you can only do in pre and post measure, then you really need to be very clear um, uh, what um, you've been doing beforehand. So if it's looking at refinements, since that seems to be our example, um, have you been counting your refinements? Um, and maybe you just need to have a sprint where what you're all you're doing is counting your refinements. And then the next time you do your experimental step, because if you don't have a clear measure as to what's happened before, you're not going to get a clear measure afterwards. Um, in the uh, in the example of having a manager be out of the room uh, versus a manager being in the room, they did have to actually do a sprint where the manager stayed in the room and they they carefully counted um, what were the innovative um, uh, measures that were made. They they had um, a, a team of you know some outsiders looking at this list of measurements and and estimating how important they were and so on. So they were very careful about it and they had to arrange for that um, the you may need to be doing estimates there's there's a, a, a book called how to measure anything that talks about the value of estimation so there's there's many things to think about um, it's not just necessarily something that you count you can ask people to estimate what's happening and then you need to have some some uh, training in how you're estimating stuff. Um, Yuta, is there more to talk about on this? We might ask you to think now in, in the uh, things that you might've been thinking of about your continuing challenges. How actually are you measuring uh, your, your continue, the, the, the situations where you have continuing challenges? And um, we might even, um, ask people to put in into the chat um, if it's refinements or whatever it is that you put down, um, how is it that you're measuring what's actually happening? And so I'd love well, to. And how can you now think of measuring it in case you are not measuring so far? Either one, just any comments about the measurement. Um, the, and so, um, the, uh, maybe we can go to the publication slide while people are thinking about that, and we'll come back to it, Yuta. Okay. 
you remember that in the, the circular chart we had uh, that um, we were saying that there's two forms of publication. One form of publication, here it is, the inner loop here. Um, if, if for your, the next time you get together to think, it could be a retrospective or whatever, you need to have somebody write up the experiment. It's not enough to sit there and say, well, we think we, this happened or that happened. It's really very helpful to write it up so that you have that, you have a record. If you're going to try it again, you have a, continu a record of continuing experiments that you've tried that you can look at later. If, if you have two or three that happen and you keep failing, well, how do we start innovating? And let's see what it is we've been doing. And that provides you a way of being sure that your group has a common memory. So it really helps to write that up uh, that everybody can look at in writing uh, when you have the next uh, session. And then the external publication, um, the, the, when, when scientists are out there um, publishing to their peers, that's really critical in validating the results of experiments that they're doing. And so maybe it's in your department, maybe it's in your company, whatever, setting up relationships where you're publishing to each other what you're doing is a way of really accelerating the innovation. If you're only trying this by yourself, then it's going to take you much longer than if somebody else is trying to replicate what you've been doing and you're replicating what they've been doing. And the reason for that is that it's a kind of control um, the, the value of a control, if we can replicate what you're doing, then it seems like, hey, we're really on to something as opposed to, hey, we did this about refinements and it sort of seemed to work, but you've tried it and it didn't make any difference at all. So then maybe what we were doing was being uh, um, uh, caused by something that we're not seeing. And, and so if it can be replicated, I'll give you one example of replication. I remember several years ago, there was a guy who was the a very well-known person in the Central Intelligence Agency in the United States. And he did an experiment in which he put lie detector probes on his philodendron plant and, and uh, had a, a way of keeping a record of, of what was happening with the, the uh, lie detector that was on the philodendron plant. And he thought that he found a pattern where when he decided he was away from the home and decided to come back home, that the philodendron plant had a little spike. And it seemed to coincide with his decision to come back home. And so he said, my goodness, the philodendron is reading my mind. We have proof of extrasensory perception. And he published it. But it turned out nobody else could replicate those findings. Nobody else. So his so-called proof ended up being, well, you know, that's interesting that you're getting that, but we're not able to replicate it. So that that publishing is the only way that you can be really sure that what you're seeing is actually happening. And I want to add here, or feel I have to add here, we are also living in a complex context, which might mean, although at first sight, you are at the same context as that other team, but if you look closely, you are not. And that's maybe the reason why you cannot replicate it because things are different from one to another. And you may I, not be able to yeah. prove cause and effect, but at least that there's that's a pattern true. Yeah. Very true. I want to um, st stress the thing that you see on that slide as well, because that's, that was for me such a big thing when I started writing that I figured that by writing, I really go through a different reflection cycle. And I have another learning curve here because writing something up is really the thing that you're having. You have to take a different perspective. You have more to take the perspective of the reader or of like, how do you explain it to somebody else? And this is often bringing, at least to me, another big learning. So I guess John wouldn't be happy with, or will not be happy with me when I'm saying now. <laughs> However, I'm saying it anyway. So even if you're not publishing it, don't tell John, writing it up already makes a huge difference. Publishing it to yourself, oh my goodness. 
Yes, that's that's kind of what I'm suggesting here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's the most internal publication there is. Yeah, oh, why not keep yeah. a diary? Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's very valuable. Yeah, right. I think writing brings you to a different part of your brain. We don't have any comments about measurement. Well, I suggest we kind of wrap it up and then we see if people have any questions still that uh, we then go into Q&A. If we use the Q&A or the chat, that's um, up to you. But let us um, kind of wrap it up. And we would like for wrapping it up you to go to Menti again. So go to menti.com. And now the code is um, 7488988. And it's still the same link as before, so I'm putting it in as well. And um, the question is, and you're seeing it, what's the most important or surprising concept you learned today? And let's let's say today in this session. I guess you have heard and learned a lot of stuff today. But let's focus on this workshop. Uh -huh. frame of thinking, importance of publication. Oh, yes. So, okay, at least I didn't put you off with the thing that maybe writing it up without public publishing it. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Otherwise, John wouldn't talk to me anymore, I'm sure. <laughs> I think keeping a diary is a, is a important. Yeah, that's true. Journaling. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Anything else? Any other things coming up to you? If, if, if there was no important or surprising concept, oh. that's, you can put that down. No surprising or important concept. It, it, yeah. Assuming that there Little was. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're we're encouraging some kind of of response. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, keeping team comfortable. Yes, very too. It all too often we, I think we forget about this, especially as coaches or scrum masters, because we are so into change, and um, not everyone is into change, and we have to accept that, respect that. And therefore, providing building pitches for them. Change your perspective. I really like that. So that's the transformative learning here. Mm -hmm. Anything else comes to your mind? And again, you can also say boring. We probably we take it personal, but it's fine. We it's okay. It. <laughs> it would be. It would be it's good. Fair. Yeah. 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 Retro action experiment. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Oh, I like that. Yes. Yes. Actually, this is kind of the thing that I believe right now that, well, I think, I hope right now that this is what the pandemic teaches us, that we have to take time to reflect and not always jumping into actions. Right. Um, what else do we see here? We have that reflect on situation, probe and adjust, yes. Publish learning. Re reflect, uh, reflect, reflect, reflect. It, it makes yeah. me think of a hall of mirrors at a carnival. <laughs> ah, yes, that's true. Yeah. yeah. You, you see you see different things. I, I like it when they set the mirrors sort of at angles to each other and you see a whole series of uh, copies of, what, of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, it's a different perspective. Right, right. So we yeah, are kind of giving you a few more seconds. Oh, probe in a chest is something wow. that comes out now. Very good. I like that. Well, probably I like everything <laughs> that you came up with right <laughs> now. Nobody said boring yet, you, you two. Well, <laughs> they, they are not brave enough, maybe. <laughs> They're being kind. Um, yes. Yeah, the, I like the keeping the team comfortable comment. That, that's, yes. 
Yeah, that's not anything we emphasize, but it's you know keeping it safe. Well, the thing was about the guinea pig and and not doing experiments on to someone, right? And um, yeah, respecting the people actually. Mm-hmm. Awesome. That sounds better than boring. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we we you can keep um, answering this. Safe for everyone, yes. Oh, I see this. And Pope in a chest jumps up more and more, and the importance of publication gets bigger too. Yeah, um, you can keep um, answering, and we are kind of closing it up here with like our contact data, so you know how you can reach us on Twitter, LinkedIn. We ha- we also have a uh, uh, group on that topic on LinkedIn. So that's the tiny URL slash atrombosanova, which you can join. And um, we have, I think, three more minutes for I, and any I have a, questions. Oh, I, I have yeah. a suggestion on the three more minutes. Q&A yes. assumes people have questions. They may have comments. So yes. why don't we could use the Q&A for comments, also reflections. Well, we can Uh, use the chat for that. That's true. The chat for questions and for comments and for anything you want to share. You see, wonderful session, learning innovation. Thank you. So in case there is anything that still puzzles you or something you would like to comment on, this is the time to share it in the chat. And there are only two minutes left I'm seeing now. Ooh. And maybe that's for me the time to stop screen sharing. So it seems there are no other comments, questions, and therefore we really would like to thank you all for coming, for joining us. It was really great fun for us uh, having you here, sharing this with you, and, and yeah, keep probing. And John, you're the one for the famous last words. Famous last words. Um, Please let us know about what you do. If you try this out, send us a note because we'd love to hear about it. If you have something you want to publish and you can't think of a good place to publish it, we can certainly take it on our website. Definitely. And uh, we we those get transferred other places sometimes, or you can point to your your friends and say there it is. So we'd love to have uh, love to hear back from you.